Well, anyways, it's good to be in worship this uh, morning with you. I know that it's kind of crazy and kind of hectic as we approach the Christmas season. Um, and we'll go over some of the Christmas Eve service stuff that's coming up in the near future in the next couple of days. But while we're here, we're gonna celebrate a week of love. Um, usually this week is the week that gets truncated. You know what I mean? Usually this is sometimes the Sunday that's only a day or two before the Christmas. So I'm, I'm excited that we get to celebrate a whole week of love with the Advent season. Next year, believe it or not, Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday. So we get the full extent next year, um, but it, it's good to spend a, a full six days at least this week instead of one or two. But I think, I think you guys have, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the sermon series as we've gone through it because there's all types of awesome traditions and fun festivities that come along with the Christmas season. Movies are one of the big ones for me. And you know, as the Christmas song says in its lyrics, it says, from all ages one to 92, we celebrate Christmas in our own unique and fantastic ways, don't we? And it's during Advent that we celebrate the season with the preparation of the coming of Christ. That's what the season of Advent is in the church. And uh, one of my family's favorite traditions to do, and we popped the movie in last night and the night before, um, it's, a, it's a favorite film of ours, favorite film. It, it's a film that has iconic moments, it has iconic music, and iconic stunts. Let's see if you like this movie also. That was like walking into church this morning, huh? Oh, Joe Pesci, don't touch it, brother. Wait for it. Dead kid. Wait for it. <laughs> That's how I want to go bald. Oh, it's terrific. I love Home Alone. Every, every boy grows up wanting to be Kevin McAllister, don't they? Uh, that's why we have to be really explicit with our two sons. We have to tell them, it's all make-believe. Don't be setting booby traps up in our home when we watch uh, Home Alone. It's a fun movie to watch, isn't it? As a kid, especially. Now as a parent, I must admit, it's like my worst nightmare. You know, in the grander scheme of things, only because you know, you're being separated from your kid and there's no direct line of communications. It's kind of terrifying fear of mine, almost. Well, in case you haven't picked up on it, I love Christmas movies. Christmas movies like Home Alone. And they have a special place for me, but how about for you? Is there something during this Christmas season? Is there a song, a tradition, a food? Maybe it's driving around and taking a look at the Christmas lights. Have you guys done that as a family yet? We're gonna hopefully do it tonight. Uh, spoiler alert, kids, you don't know that, but you're gonna have to spend an hour and a half in the car with me as we drive around our, our neighborhoods. Um, looking at, you know, what, what are the special things that make Christmas special for you? This year at Church of Lakes, we've been examining one of my favorite Christmas movies. It's one that I think transcends the Christmas story. It's thrilled young tots for years. He's a foul one. He smells a nasty, wasky skunk with unwashed socks. That's what it says from the song. The one and only The Grinch. The Grinch, I think it provides some valuable lessons for us. You know, we looked at a couple of weeks ago around the theme of hope, of how with unmet expectations, we can kind of have our hope crushed a little bit, can't we, with unmet expectations? When unmet expectations, they can warp and twist our hearts and minds into being hateful and angry, and we as Christians are instead to reject the hate and anger of life. And we are instead supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus, who will never disappoint us with unmet expectations and provides an eternal type of hope. Two weeks ago, we examined that you don't need all the trappings and trimmings of Christmas to have Christmas, right? Uh, you know, we talked about parodies, right? There are so many things 
during the Christmas season that look like Christmas, but don't actually have Christmas at the center of what they stand for. And peace is one of those things that we have to be careful not to to parody in life. Last week we examined where our source of joy should come from. Our joy should come from the Lord. We saw that represented in the very first Christmas song that Mary gave to us through the Magnificat, which implored us to magnify the Lord, not only in our hearts, but in our minds also. This week we're gonna examine love, the theme for Advent this week. And love is what helps us overcome so many barriers in life. Specifically, we're gonna see how love, we can use it to overcome the great fears, stresses, and anxiety that we carry in our everyday walks, especially those fears that hold us back from being fully committed disciples to Jesus Christ. You know, it's said in our scriptures that there is over 365 uses of the phrase, don't be afraid. Now that's stretching the truth a little bit. In actuality, if you were to thumb through every page of the Bible, you would still find it though over 100 times in our scriptures. You'd see the phrase, do not be afraid, do not fear, fear not. And believe it or not, at the Christmas story, there is a lot of the scriptures that have to do with fear. It's not an emotion we typically associate with Christmas, is it? But we see written in our scriptures over and over and over again around Christmas, we see fear not, do not be afraid. And I'm gonna do something a little different this morning, so bear with me. We're gonna read through four successive uh, passages of scripture. I'm gonna show you how fear plays a role in the Christmas story. So our first scripture reading, it's out of Luke chapter one. Read along with me in verses eight and 13. Once when he, and uh, that's Zechariah, once when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. That's the first. The second scripture reading, we're jumping a little bit further down in Luke 1, the verses 26 through 30. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was? Mary, we know that of course. And he came to her and said, greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this must be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. We're gonna jump to Matthew chapter one. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And finally, our last passage in Luke 2. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God, let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be found holy and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Fear not, do not be afraid. Yeah, it's one of those phrases we say, but easier said than done, right? (laughs) Fear, it can run rampant in our lives at times. With the anxiety and stresses, especially quite often associated with this time of year. (laughs) You know, fear, it sucks all the hope 
and peace and joy and love out of the Advent season. That's what it does. In fact, did you know that there's such a thing called Christogenia toki? No, I messed it up. Hold on. Christogenia tocophobia. Let me say it again. I worked really hard this week and I messed it up. Christogenia tocophobia. Phobia, fear, Christ, Christmas. It's the fear of Christmas, which includes, which I find fascinating, some symptoms to see if you have the fear of Christmas. Do you have the fear of flashing lights? This isn't the worship service for you then. And if you have a fear, fear for Santa Claus, the big red man. (laughs) Phobias, fears, at this time of year, they always remind me of this famous clip from a Charlie Brown's Christmas. Let's take a look. I think we better pinpoint your fears. If we can find out what you're afraid of, we can label it. Are you afraid of responsibility? If you are, then you have hypengeophobia. I don't think that's quite it. How about cats? If you're afraid of cats, you have aneurophasia. Well, sort of, but I'm not sure. Are you afraid of staircases? If you are, (laughs) then you have climacophobia. Maybe you have thalassophobia. This is fear of the ocean. Or chephorobia, which is the fear of crossing bridges. Or maybe you have pantophobia. Do you think you have pantophobia? What's pantophobia? The fear of everything. That's it! (laughs) Actually, Lucy, my trouble is Christmas. I just don't understand it. Instead of feeling happy, I feel sort of let down. Yeah, that's the problem with fears. They make it impossible to figure out and enjoy certain things in life. That's what phobias do. Just like Lucy, though, we are so quick to WebMD, to self-diagnose and then self-medicate, of course, ourselves, to attempt to whisk away the fear as much as possible. We would rather feel nothing than feel fear. That's what we believe. Ultimately, I actually believe that fear is a huge motivating factor. I know it is for me, for most of us even, because most of us have the fear of failure. It's what pushes us forward, even though we're doggone tired at times, isn't it? There's also the fear of loneliness, isn't there? That's why we get involved in almost too many social activities, because of the fear of loneliness at times, right? Ultimately, I believe fear is a huge motivating factor factor. And the Grinch, I think he understands that. Of course, in our story, we know that the Grinch, he utilizes the fear of losing Christmas as his ultimate weapon against the Who's down in Whoville by stealing the presents, the trees, the trappings, the trimmings. The Who's, they're going to wake up that Christmas morning, they're going to see the Christmas didn't come at all. In which fear, panic, desperation are going to fill their hearts all to the Grinch's grand pleasure. The Grinch is hell-bent on punishing the Who's because they love Christmas. That's what he thinks. He thinks they love Christmas more than anything, and he's going to hurt them where it hurts the most (laughs) by taking away Christmas. So as that sleigh is teetering on the top of Mount Crumpet, right, just on the precipice of taking a deep and drastic plunge into the abyss. <laughs> He's like a super evil villain, isn't he? He pauses in those moments, like every villain in a comic book. He pauses to hear the boo-hoos from the who's down below. That's what he stops to do. What the story surmises, what Dr. Seuss is really trying to hammer home in the story of the Grinch, he's trying to show us that a person with a heart that's two sizes too small, they are incapable They are impossible, they are unable to show love. A person who is gripped by stress, anxiety, fear, they are unable to show love. That's how how the world works. We're unable to, to display the love of Christ when we allow fear to overcome us. And the Grinch's soul in this moment is completely immersed in the depths of darkness. You know, how about how about for you? I know that we talked about a couple of weeks ago about how anger fits into the Christmas story with King Herod a little bit, but do you have an anger with someone this Christmas? Is there someone who you're trying to avoid at all costs at the Christmas celebrations? You know what I mean? That hatred in your heart that you just need to let go? Are you crippled by anxiety and stress as Christmas gets ever so closer where you're staring up at the ceiling trying to fall asleep at night? (laughs) Has fear grabbed a hold of your soul? As Christians, how could we possibly 
live out our mission of spreading the love of Jesus Christ to everyone we meet, if we're gripped by hatred and by stress and by fear, how can we ever do it? How can we overcome those things in life? Because it's impossible to set those things aside. We are always gonna have stress. We are always gonna have fears. We are always gonna be angry at something, especially at the people who forget how to drive once it snows for the first time. <laughs> I, think, I think we find an answer, though, of course, in our scriptures especially when it comes around the Christmas story, how we can overcome those fears, those things that weigh us down at this season. And I think we find it in John, which is unusual because in the book of John, we don't actually see the true Christmas story laid out chronologically like we do in Matthew or Luke. But follow me here. John chapter three, we're gonna be reading verses 19 through 21, if I find my place. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world And people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who did evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. I find that fascinating. The dichotomy between love and light on one side and fear and darkness on the other. We see that play out in the Christmas story, but I especially see it, ironically, in the movie The Grinch. Here, let me, let me walk you through it, okay? I'm blown away how it so strongly describes The Grinch. For all who do evil hate the light. That's what our scripture says. For all who do evil hate the light. Uh, what does The Grinch do? When, when does he do all of his dastardly deeds? Where does he do them? All under the cover of darkness, doesn't he? He goes around home to home, stealing the presents, also like our scripture says, so that his deeds may not be exposed. In contrast, it's the light that shines across the world that spreads love into it, right? But those who do what is true come to the light so they may be seen clearly that their deeds have been done in God. It's not a coincidence to me that as we read our scriptures this morning, that one of the scripture readings about the shepherds, did you catch this? That the angels appeared, and the light of God shone around them, right? An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. This dazzling light, it illuminates the night sky, doesn't it? The light almost acting like this almighty cleaning agent. It's washing away the darkness, it's evading it, pushing it away, but where does it ultimately end up? That fear and the darkness, it ends up going into the shepherds. Did you catch that? Because they all of a sudden, they become fearful. They become overwhelmed with the fear. And my, my question is, why? Why do the shepherds go from being so, enjoying the, the nighttime sky, their break from having to trot around their sheep, why do they go immediately to fear? Is it the startledness of the angels appearing before them? I'm sure that has something to do with it. I think it's the light, friends. I think it's the light that just breaks through to them and shines onto them because from this light, all of a sudden these shepherds are fully exposed before God, are they not? They're fully exposed. The angels of the Lord, they see, they see these shepherds for what they really are, which means they probably see their actions, of course. They see what they're doing. But God sees into our hearts, our minds, and souls, doesn't he also? So that means the angels probably could see into these shepherds their thoughts, their intentions. Ooh, that's a little terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> when it comes to putting our full intentions and our thoughts on display, don't we like to keep those under lock and key? <laughs> even we try and keep those away from our own God at times, even though we know he can get to them. It's why we're so guarded with our personal relationships, aren't we? Because it's only by a true act of love does someone expose their authentic, true self to another. It's a true act of love to do that when we share who we really are with other people, expose our innermost selves. And you know, it's not just the metaphorical sense that we get exposed by the light, of course. You know, it's during this Christmas season that we find a new appreciation for light, don't we? We're getting ever so close to December 21st, the first day of winter, aren't we? But it's also the shortest day of daylight of the year, is it not? And we, I think, have a new appreciation for sunlight when it comes to December 21st, don't we? Don't we long for those days to get longer and longer so we can just have a little bit more time in the day to spend outside, it seems like? (laughs) We We as Christians, metaphorically, of course, we need to allow that light 
to shine within us, even when it's dark outside, even if that means it exposes us to our Lord in some type of vulnerable, scary way. <laughs> and to reflect that light onto the others should be our ultimate goal. That's our call of action today. If you hear nothing else today, hear this, okay? We are to be the children of light, not of darkness. Children of light, which means that we need to take the characteristics and the values of our God and we need to shine them into our local communities, at work, in our homes, in our schools. That's our call from our Lord to do that. We need to really be more joyful, more hopeful, more peaceful, and of course today's theme of Advent is love. We need to be more loving to those who we meet, of course. We see it specifically in Luke chapter two. I wanna share with you just one more passage out of our scriptures you can never get enough scripture about how Jesus is the light unto the world. I want you to see this, that plays out at the end of the Christmas story. So Jesus is dedicated at the temple. It's a Jewish custom that eight days after the birth of your son that you get him dedicated in the temple. Now, Mary and Joseph, they make the trip from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, and as they walk into the temple, there's a holy and righteous man by the name of Simeon, who upon sight, he recognizes Jesus as something different. He recognizes him as the savior to all people. And this is the encounter between Simeon and Jesus. Read along with me. Simeon took him, Jesus, in his arms and praised God by saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. A light for revelation. That's what Jesus is, friends. He's a light, isn't he? He's dedicated from birth as a light, a light unto the world, a light that exposes hate and reveals evil, a light that shines and spreads love, a light that we are to copy and emulate each and every day of our lives. We are to be a light for revelation. If we just allow the light of Christ to shine into us, I get that scary, to expose yourself, your thoughts, your intentions, your actions, everything you do, exposing yourself by allowing the light of Christ to shine into you. But friends, hear this, when you allow the light of Christ to shine onto you and into you, instead of putting up a barrier, there's something amazing that happens, a total transformation. We almost become like a mirror because we can never put light out into the world on our own accord. It's only by the light of Christ, allowing it into us, does it get reflected out onto other people. That's how our God works. He uses us. He uses us almost like a mirror by working through us. Nothing that we ever do in this life is on our own accord. It all has to come from the Lord, but we have to allow it to happen. We have to open the windows and allow God in, into our lives, and then we can be like those angels so many Christmases ago that are shining glory of God onto others. You know, at the end of the Grinch, there's also a quite of transformation, isn't there? Upon the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his sleigh to the tip top to dump it. <laughs> But like I said, every evil villain before him, he stops and pauses, doesn't he? The Grinch pauses for the moment to hear the crying, the pouting from the Who's or who are awaking from their Christmas slumber. Soon to realize that Christmas didn't come, the Who's will be devastated. So he listens. But of course, as the story goes, the Grinch, he doesn't hear the wailing and lamenting from below, does he? Instead, he hears a sound rising above the snow. It started in low and then it started to grow. The sound wasn't sad, it was glad. Every who down in Whoville was singing, the tall and the small, <laughs> without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming, it came. Somehow or the other, it came just the same. <laughs> the Grinch, he sees the light. He knows something is different. And all of a sudden, he is totally transformed. Christmas wasn't about the presents he sees or the decorations that he stole, no. <laughs> It was about the love that we shine and show for one another. So the Grinch, he realizes the errors of his ways, and when he finishes the movie in this way.
what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then, the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches, plus two. Do you see the transformation? Of course, everyone pays attention to how his heart grows three sizes, but you see, as soon as his heart grew three sizes, his face began to shine. And then as he lifts the sleigh above his head, you see the shining light that's behind him. It's not a coincidence, friends. Dr. Seuss was getting to it. Well, what happened that day? Well, in Whoville, they say, the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. The love of Christ, friends, is what we're supposed to shine on everyone that we meet. The one who is the light of the world, Jesus, he exposes evil, and instead he spreads love. That is the true meaning of Christmas. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the gift of your son. And as we get ever so closer to celebrating this Christmas celebration, allow us to be a light, a reflection of you in our communities, our homes, our schools and workplaces, because Lord, we know that it's your light that we shine, not our own. And it's from that light that we experience and decipher what true love really is for one another. A love that is meant to do so much more than what we knew possibly could ever come from our own being. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.